Uh, VM, also known as Vicky, is a manager of technical people, projects, processes, products, and uh, businesses. In her more than 18 years in the technical industry, she has been an analyst, programmer, project, ma project manager, sorry, product manager, software engineering manager, and director of software engineering. Yeah. Currently, she is a senior engineering manager in service of an upstream open source development team at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And she's going to be talking about the Internet Archive. Is it showing? It is. Everything is showing. <laughs> Shush you. I know. I am a tech professional. Hang on just a second. Hate displays. Oh, you know what might help? So how is everyone today as I do a little IT fuckery up here? Good. Excellent. Pardon? Can you move it up? Can I move it up a little bit? Because apparently I can't be heard well. Well, let's see what this does. Ooh, precisely what I wanted. Excellent. Anyway, hello. I am Vicki Brasur. Um, you will find me online as VM Brasur. It's really weird looking like this, for the record. Um, but we are all friends here, so you can call me Vicky. Here's my contact information. If you care to tweet at me or just follow me on Twitter, VM Brasur, um, I might tweet just a lot. Um, apologies for that in advance. Okay. Um, as well, I have the contact information up here for Alexis Rossi. Alexis is um, usually my co-presenter for this, but she is unable to be here. She is the Director of Media and Access at Internet Archive. Um, but the Archive being a nonprofit, she can't be here. Um, I, as you heard, work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We are a for-profit. And I am very grateful that they have paid for me to be here today. I am a senior engineering manager. I work in service of a team which is 100% dedicated to upstream open source development. And yes, that is just as wonderful as you think it sounds. So in a moment, I'm going to flash up a slide which contains some links. These are very important links. If you want to take photos of them, I suggest you get your phones ready now. Um, I will show them again at the end if you wait to wish or if you wish to wait and see, oh, you, for the record, you can't turn your head like this because people can't hear you. Um, so if you want to just wait and see whether it's actually worth snapping the photos, I'll show them at the end. So here are those links. Let me tell you what they are. The first one is pretty much self-explanatory. That is the Internet Archive GitHub repo. A lot of the APIs I'm going to discuss can be found there. After that, these slides are already available, so you can follow along at home. Um, unless my upload failed. Um, but regardless, that is at that second link. If they're not there now, they will be shortly. As well, once this video is available, I will be downloading it and putting it back up on that very same link there in the middle. So it can be a one-stop shop. And the bottom link is the one that I think is the most important. And that is the Zotero bibliography for this presentation. Every single API, every single example that I'm going to show you is linked from this Zotero bibliography. So you don't have to go snapping photos all through this thing looking for documentation. No, no, no. One-stop shop right there. All right. So now we get into the rough part of the conversation here, which is uh, this is where Alexis would normally step in. Today, the role of Alexis is played by me. And I'm going to give you a tour of the Internet Archive. This is the archive. This is the archive building. It is based in San Francisco, California. But we have scanning centers all over the world. This is an old Christian science church. Um, we will neither confirm nor deny that we bought it because it looks like our logo. <laughs> I'll be showing you some pictures from the inside of the church as we go along. Um, it is absolutely stunning inside of it. We are a nonprofit digital library. Our mission and goal in life is universal access to all human knowledge. Make it as freely available to as many people as possible. We have a lot of partners who work with that. Um, we've got libraries and memory institutions like um, archives and museums who partner with us to try and get more information available to more people. We are an accredited and registered library. We are the real deal. We don't just, we don't just play library on TV, we actually are one. Right now, we have a little over 24 petabytes of information. 
uh, that is duplicated once. And then we have some overhead for like running the website and services and stuff like that. So it's it is approximately 55 petabytes of spinning disk, which we maintain ourselves. This is a picture from the great room inside of that church where they used to hold services. Now we hold our fabulous open information um, events. It's a beautiful place. Uh, and it happens to contain a beautiful pipe organ, which you can play. Pro tip. All right, so the question we get asked more than anything else is, where do you get your money? So we're just going to get that out of the way right up front. 40% of this comes from digitization projects. Libraries and other organizations come to us and they say, hi, could you please scan these and make them available to us? And we're like, sure, we'll do that. So we do that. That's 40%. Um, that is, by the way, 40% of 14 to $15 million. 20% comes from web archiving projects where people contract with us to scrape the web for them. How many Kiwis do we have in the audience? We have, OK, we have a few. Um, the rest of you, I'm sure, are just are at least Kiwi positive. Um, <laughs> so uh, we do web crawls. The National Library of New Zealand has contracted with the archive to frequently do web crawls of every single .nz uh, domain out there. And we will do that, and then we will take it, and we will hand it to them and say, here's your archive. And they do whatever it is they need to do with that. But then we also make it available on, uh, this sound keeps cutting out. Uh, that's what we, we also make it available on the Wayback Machine. Um, the final 40% comes from foundations and donations, some from beautiful people like you. And I'm very proud that this adds up to 100. So <laughs> moving on, uh, we have approximately 100 employees right now at the archive, again, scattered across the globe, but primarily focused in San Francisco, because wow, San Francisco. Um, one of the kind of interesting and or slightly creepy things that we do, depending upon your point of view, is once you reach your third year anniversary at the archive, we have an, a, uh, an artist friend make one of these cute little creepy statues. Um, so that's fun. And these sit, pardon me, this is driving me nuts. Excellent. OK, um, so these sit in the pews in that great room that I showed you earlier. Um, so speaking of people, who are the people who use the archive? We are in the top 250 websites across the entire world. Where we fall in that depends upon who is the new hotness that day, of course. Three to four million people a day visit the archive. We have approximately four million streams every single day. But aside from that, we have no bloody clue. We keep no information about you whatsoever. We don't even have your IP address. We have it and IP address and logs, but we fake it. So yeah, we don't know who you are. You could be the exact same person hitting us 4 million times a day, and we wouldn't know. Um, privacy is incredibly important to us, not just because we're a library, but because it's the right thing to do. So as I mentioned, we do have 55 petabytes of spinning disk. Um, this is some of that spinning disk. This is in that building you saw in San Francisco. If you ever visit, and I do recommend you do so, go into the great room, turn around, and there are racks and racks of beautiful, beautiful machines with blue blinking lights. It's incredibly impressive. Um, so here they are. We have two data centers. We have the one in San Francisco. Then we have one across the bay in Richmond, California. Those of you who are geographically inclined right about now are going, wait, you have your main data center and your backup data center both in the same geographic area, and oh, by the way, fault lines. Um, yeah, we recognize this as a problem, but again, we also feel very deeply the cut of being a nonprofit. So if you have plenty of money, please come to us, and we will gladly use your money to set up a data center on the other side of the world, the other side of the country, whatever. But right now, duplicating 55 petabytes of stuff and moving it and setting it up and keeping it running is not cheap. So yes, at least we have a backup. <laughs> That's something. When I say Internet Archive, most of the time people are like, I don't know. And then I say, oh, by the way, we do the Wayback Machine. They're like, oh, I love you. That is the best thing ever. It saves my ass on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, we do the Wayback Machine. That's what we are most known for, is the Wayback Machine. We have right now over 425 billion captures. These go all the way back to 1996, but we have leads for stuff back to 1994 that we're looking at getting. So that's super exciting. Excuse me a moment. OK, so the Wayback Machine is usually updated within hours of something going up on the web if it's something that we already track. 
about 700,000 people a day, we think, because again, we're not sure if it's the same one person's hitting us 700,000 times, um, they go to the Wayback Machine, and it's really cool. Um, so it is fairly popular. If you are a researcher, you can come to us and ask, and we will give you just, bloop, here you go, an 80 terabyte bolus of data of the internet that you can use for your research. Um, just talk to us, write alexis at archive.org, because as you know, I'm not there anymore. But um, write Alexis and she can give this to you. How many of you in the audience have never seen the Wayback Machine before? All right, so this slide is mostly useless. <laughs> um, so most of you have already seen the Wayback Machine. You know what it's like. This is the Wayback Machine of, oh, 2014. I should update this uh, for GNU.org. Um, so people ask, and justifiably so, why do we, how do we decide what to crawl? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, people pay us, yay, dot, nz. So all of that is available in the archive. We also do deep crawls on popular sites. You remember, we're in, within the top 250. We crawl those. We do as deep as possible on all of those. Um, also, we have organizations who will donate content to us. Alexa Internet is one of them. A few times a year, at least two, I believe, sometimes four, I forget. Um, they will hand us a great big wad of content, and we make it available in the archive, in the Wayback Machine. But we also do a lot of targeted crawls that we have just decided are a really good idea. First of all, we will do a deep crawl in all popular sites, as I mentioned. Um, but we will also, where are my notes? There we go. Ooh, yeah. How many of you tweet YouTube links or retweet YouTube links? Every single time you do that, we crawl that YouTube video. So we watch Twitter, the entire fire hose, and we get those. Um, so that's pretty cool. We also, every outlink from every Wikipedia page in every language, we crawl those. Every page on every wordpress.com or .org site, we crawl those. Every link on every page in every wordpress.com site, we crawl those. So we have a lot of stuff going on that we just do on our own without anyone asking us. Um, the primary goal of all this is to reduce 404s on the web. So uh, we would ideally love to get this sort of functionality built into a browser. If you work on Firefox, are you here? No, I do know one person who works on Firefox, but they're not here. Um, yeah, we want to get this built into Firefox. So when you go browsing around, we can just grab things, and it's like, I went here, fine, we're going to grab that. I went there, fine, going to grab that. More importantly, when you're browsing around, if you hit a 404, we can automatically redirect you to the closest snapshot. Wouldn't that be cool? No more 404s because you just go into the Wayback Machine. Go talk to Mozilla. We want to do this. Um, there's one more way you can get things into the Wayback Machine, and that's by doing it yourself. This is web.archive.org. We have this fancy little doodad. Ooh, I can use a pointer now that my microphone's on the wrong side. Aren't you all happy? Um, so just slam a URL in there, um, and we will immediately crawl it and immediately hand you back a citable URL. This is handier than you think. Let's say you're in a country where it's election season. Just throwing that out there. And um, let's say one of your Congress critters says something a little untoward on, fa on Facebook or on Twitter. You can grab that URL, slam it in here, and we will archive it, hand you back a URL, which is citable. And then their handlers find out, and they delete it. And it doesn't matter, because we have it. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, you can link all of these. I'll give that back to the archive when I'm back in San Francisco. They will need that. So um, as I mentioned, we also do book scanning. This is one of our scanning centers. This is pretty cool. Uh, we have 30 scanning centers in eight countries so far, and we're getting more as quickly as we possibly can. But as you can imagine, this is not a cheap setup. Right now, we're doing about 1,000 books a day, a little more than that. And this is pretty impressive when you stop to think that this is an incredibly manual process. Lots of places digitize books. Some of them are very large organizations. One of the ways they do this is by cutting the spines off and putting them through an automatic feeder. We don't do that. We respect the book for books. Um, so this is a very manual process. These people are very carefully turning the pages, sometimes on books 
back to like the 15, 1600s. So you have to be very delicate with some of these. It's a very manual process. Um, and we do respect the books themselves, despite the fact that they're not in obsolete format. And that's because books burn. This is that very same scanning center burning to the ground. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. There was nobody in the building at that time. It happened at night. There was an intern, by the way, who was living right up here at that point. Um, he was fine. But um, yeah, so all the books that were in there, they were gone, completely lost. Thankfully, they had been scanned. So while the physical artifacts were gone, the knowledge was not. So we were able to do that because we digitized. We could not have done that without it. Uh, despite the fact that we do prefer digitization right now because it allows more people to access it from more places, we believe in the physical objects. As I've mentioned, we'd like to take care of them. So now we have the physical archive. We have two of them, as a matter of fact. We have two warehouses. These are warehouses full and full of climate control containers. We've been doing containerization longer than Docker. <laughs> So the physical archive, we have 1.5 uh, million books right there um, and growing. We, anything we can get our hands on that is of any significance, we put it in there. So we've got VHS, we've got software, we've got LPs, we've got hardware to read these things because, you know, just having the shit doesn't matter if you can't read it. So, you know, we've got lots of stuff in here. The, we are thinking of this as kind of a seed bank for the future. So um, if you are trying to say, get a backup that you've made, and suddenly your backup goes pear-shaped, it doesn't matter that you have a backup if you can't read it. We know that this happens. So what we're doing is we're building a seed bank in case of that emergency. We will have backups that we can go back to that don't require electricity, that don't require formats that we can no longer read. It's pretty cool. So we do have all those books, 1.5 million physical copies alone. How do you find them? Well, hey, guess what? We are a library. <laughs> yeah. Just go to the library, openlibrary.org in particular. Um, it's pretty cool. It's beautiful. It's the best way to find books on the archive. It is, uh, I guess, an, it's analogous to Wikipedia. Consider it one web page for every book ever published. So if you go to the, uh, to, open library and you find there isn't a web page for the book, consider it like Wikipedia. You can go at it. Add a page for that book. Update the page for someone else. You can keep this information going. You can also download books here if licensing allows you to. Even if licensing doesn't allow you to download it, you can check it out because, hello, again, we're a library. So you can check out these books from openlibrary.org. We also have a free print disabled access to all of our books. So we got books, we got video. OMG, do we have video? We have at least two million items and it's growing every single day. Um, it covers the gamut of all things. We do have feature films, we have cartoons, we have the cheesiest ass commercials from the 50s you've ever seen. Um, we've got a lot of stuff uh, that is called, um, it's ephemera. It, and this is in what, it's primarily collected in the Prelinger archive, which is astonishing. The most, who would ever record this stuff in the world is there. It's really great. Um, so this is brilliant. But we also archive 65 channels of TV, 24-7, 365, and we've been doing this for far longer than we've been allowed to say that we've been doing this. Um, Unfortunately, copyright law being what it is, we cannot make most of that available. What we can make available is TV news. So we have the TV news archive. For the first time in the history of humanity, TV is a citable resource. What you can do is you can go here and you can search the captions for all TV news. You can find the snippet of what somebody said where, and you get a link directly to that snippet that you can use in your research, that you can use in your papers, that you can use in your journalism. It's really, really great. And we just expanded this for the American election season uh, for, to include political commercials. So we have an entire archive specifically for political commercials, which journalists are using to do fact checking on. It's pretty sweet. But wait, there's more. We have audio. 
We have so much audio, uh, 2.5 million items so far, the world's largest live music archive, including literally, not figuratively, literally every single live show the Grateful Dead ever did. <laughs> Dedication, man. Gotta love the fans. Um, we also have uh, audiobooks. I don't know how many of you know of LibreVox, the audiobook um, uh, service. It is all open source, it's all public domain, it's all regular people like y'all doing books. It's cool. They host their stuff with us. We have a lot of radio shows and podcasts as well. If you do a podcast, you can host your stuff with us for free. We will keep it safe in perpetuity. The thing that everybody really loves right now, though, the hottest, hottest thing on the archive is the software. How many of you guys played with the software on the software archive? How many of you had no idea that you can go to archive.org and play games emulated in your browser? Yeah. Guess what y'all are doing? I just fucked your entire week. <laughs> All right, so I didn't actually do this. Jason Scott did this and his uh, amazing team of volunteers. If there are any people out here who are massive JavaScript jockeys or want to become one, they are pushing the bleeding edge of JavaScript to make this emulation work. It's really sweet, and they would love more volunteers. But you've got games here that you can play, and you've got console games, and PC games, and DOS games, and you can go play with Lotus 1, 2, 3. I mean, it's just astonishing. And it's far more useful than just having like the ISO of the game. Now you can see it. Now you can see the old software. Um, they didn't think it could be done. Jason proved him wrong. He has a stupid habit of doing that. Uh, so, this pretty much concludes our tour of the archive before I jump into the part that I really know well. And some people come to us and they're like, well, why should I care? You're just a library, why do I care? Well, we've been doing this shit before anyone even thought it was possible, before anyone thought it was necessary. We're really good at digitization, we're really good at preserving data. Um, we have been doing this and we, we now do stuff that nobody else thought was possible, and we are the ones who made it possible. We believe in the exact same stuff as, the, as all open source communities. That's keeping things open, that's sharing, that's sharing knowledge as well as information um, on how to do things. We also believe very, very deeply in privacy. We fight for that. We have gone to federal court to fight for privacy, and we have won. Uh, I don't know how many of you have actually looked at the archive recently, but you might notice we have gotten a facelift recently. Uh, so it's a little slicker than it used to be, which is nice. Um, but it still could use some work. There will be a volunteer slide later, I think. So that concludes your tour of Internet Archive. Now we're going to get to the part that I know. Alexis isn't the geek of the pair. That's me. So I'm going to talk to you about APIs. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I am a manager. So let me do something we call in management, setting up expectations. There are a lot of these things, and I don't have a lot of time to cover them all, so I'm just gonna go super shallow, right? I'm just going to introduce them all to you, give you an example, then move on. And then I'm gonna leave it to you to go deep later on the things that you really think are interesting. Also, don't forget that Zotero link has links to all of these things in it. So you can go and find it later. We're going to start with the one that everybody knows best as far as our services, and that is the Wayback Machine. It does have an API. This thing is uh, its a study in simplicity and ease, shall we say. It does everything you want and not what you don't. It tells you exactly these two things. Is it archived, this URL? And if so, uh, is it available in the Wayback Machine? It will hand you back a URL. It will do it all in JSON because as Dan said, JSON's cool. So here's an example of what you do. There are exactly three parameters, only one of which is required. Here are those parameters. The URL, surprise, is the only one that's required. When you are giving us this URL, please do not give us the protocol. We don't need to know it's HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, Archie, Gopher, we don't care, right? Just give us the URL. Um, Timestamp is optional. If uh, you give that to us, we will, if, and a snapshot exists, we will return you the snapshot closest to that timestamp. And then callback just returns it in JSONP instead of JSON, whatever. 
For the examples in this uh, section of the talk, I will be using kind of a space theme. Um, so I'm going to see whether this page here is available in the archive. This is from NASA. It is the, uh, their page on the solar system and the planets, and it does not include Pluto. <sighs> I know, so sad. <sighs> Shush, you. Ne'er do well. OK, so we're going to throw that URL to the API, see what we get. Um, you can see all I'm doing is passing little URL. This is what we get back. Um, and you can see that, yes, this is, in fact, available. Here's the URL to the snapshot right there. Here's the date of that snapshot, status 200. We all know what that is. Um, just means that we were able to access that particular website on that date. Had this not been available, it would have looked like this. Um, so this is used far less often than I think it should be. But probably each and every one of you can use it today by installing this. This is the Archives 404 handler. This is a tiny piece of JavaScript that you can drop on any page that you own. And if uh, your, your users hit a 404 on those pages, we will automatically redirect them to the closest snapshot of the link they were trying to go to. It's pretty cool. Um, and again, it, it provides a much, much better experience for your visitors. All right, so like I said, simplicity and ease, small API. Next, we've got the Open Library API, which is the antithesis of small API. The entire Open Library system is run off of this API. It is fully RESTful. It can return all sorts of stuff. You can query the database here. You can update and edit information. You can view all the record history, history because again, this is like Wikipedia. We do keep a history for every page. Um, it is fairly robust. It is also one of the few well-documented APIs we have. Full disclosure, our docs suck for the most part. Um, so since it is pretty involved, I'm just going to have a super simple example here. I'm going to look for all of the books with a subject of Pluto. I want it returned in JSON, and I know there's going to be a ton, so I want to limit one. Just want to get one of these back. Um, you're not going to be able to read the next slide very much, but you don't have to. It's just to show you that, yes, we return stuff. Um, and this book here is The Planets by Heather Cooper and Nigel Henbest. Go, Heather and Nigel. Um, so uh, yeah, that's just one example of the stuff you can do. And you can see it's returned in JSON, so you can do all the parsing you need. Um, it will also return in XML if you put a different format at the end. Rather than, um, rather than Pluto.json, you can do Pluto.xml and I believe Pluto.rdf as well, I think. Um, that's why they dock these things. I don't have to remember them. So this is used in some places you might have seen already. I don't know uh, if you know what library system your public library uses. I was in library software for six years, so I pay a lot of attention to this sort of stuff. Both Evergreen and Koha are open source library systems. And both of them use the Open Library API to get book covers, to get tables of content, to get anything they possibly could or might want into their bibliographic records. So uh, this API is being hit a lot by public libraries all over the world who use both Evergreen and Koha. Um, so we do have all these books. And a lot of them we are contracted to scan. Um, but a lot of other ones come from people like you, donating books to us. That's where the Do We Want It API comes in. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, which is to say whether we want this book. So as I mentioned earlier, we are in the Bay Area. I don't know what y'all know about the Bay Area, California, but real estate is kind of at a premium. So um, while we would very much love to take every single book that you send to us, and we will accept them, we would rather they were books that we actually needed. We don't need 57 copies of every Harry Potter book in every language. <sighs> yeah. Um, so what you can do is you can use this. When you're, say, moving house, and you're starting to pare down your books, you can send us a box of books that, you, that we need. Just use this. All you have to do is give us a, an ISBN, either 10 or 13. And I'm sorry, this is programming. You don't need to, to strip out the dashes, because we're going to do that for you. Um, that's what computers are good at. So uh, let's test this. We're going to use this book by. Uh, Neil Pluto Killer DeGrasse Tyson and Donald Goldsmith. 
<laughs> I actually don't have a horse in that race. It's just kind of fun to pick on him. Sorry, Neil. Um, so I'm um, going to throw this to, do we want an API and see what happens? We get this back. Um, this is relatively well documented ish. Uh, so you will be able to parse this with the docs. But you can see here, want for IAPA, want this for the Internet Archive, physical archive. So yeah, package this book up, ship it to us. We will scan it, make it available, and open library.org, and then put the physical object in our physical archive. That's pretty cool. Here's a quick snapshot of those docs, but you don't need those because there's a URL that you're going to get later, or you already saw. So instead, how do you find stuff? We do have millions and millions and millions, 24 petabytes of stuff, I mean, for crying out loud. So we have the advanced search API. And to be completely honest and forthright with you beautiful people, calling it an API is the pinnacle of optimism. Um, what it really is is a relatively easily extrapolatable URL format. Um, someday, when I find a few more to it, I will document this so you don't have to go spelunking in URLs, but until that day, you're going spelunking in URLs. Let's try that. Here we go. So what you do is you go to our advanced search page, you enter some information. Let's say I want all the texts with a subject of Pluto. Let's see what comes back. This is what comes back. I get this web page right here. And here is the URL in my location bar. You can see it's pretty easy. What's the query? Query, media type, text, right, and subject Pluto. I haven't programmed since 2009, and I can do this, right? I can figure out how to programmatically do this API stuff. Um, but the problem is I am getting back a web page. And having been at the archive and having been in the business of scraping web pages, you don't want to do this. You really don't. You want us to do this. Um, so instead, we have options. You can get it returned in JSON, because again, that is one of the new hotness. But if you don't want JSON, that's fine. We can do better than that. We can do RDF. We can do XML. We can do RSS. We can do CSV. What do you want? OK, we can do that. Um, so that's what that URL looks like. You can see right here, output JSON. Pretty easy. Um, but again, not specifically documented. However, it is incredibly powerful. If I take this and I throw it, this URL, into curl or what have you, I get back something like that, which you don't really need to read because all you need to see is, yeah, it returns stuff and it looks like JSON. But I do want to point out this thing right here. This is incredibly important in the archive, and that is the identifier. Every single thing in the archive is collected in something we call an item. Um, and so all those 24 plus petabytes of stuff are collected in items. Each item has a unique human readable identifier. That's what that is. These make the archive tick. So they're really important, and I'm going to be using this one in a future example, which is why I pointed out now. So how many of you here, this is like, I keep getting you all engaged, keep you awake after lunch. So um, Lucene and Elasticsearch, anything like that, who's used that? Ah, you poor people, you don't look like alcoholics. Um, so this is a Lucene-based search, which means you get all the fun doodads and gigas that you get with Lucene and the like. Um, so you can do date ranges and fuzzy matching and all that beautiful stuff. That makes it a fairly powerful and robust system for you to find things in 24 petabytes. Um, but you might not want to. It's kind of a pain because Lucene, right? So what you can do is instead use the Internet Archive Metadata API. Um, and you can use this because it's so much faster even than our Lucene-based advanced search. This is wicked fast. Super quick example, I'm going to throw that identifier from earlier slide into our metadata um, API thing here. It will return JSON because, again, la, 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 everything returns JSON. OK, and it returns this. Again, you don't have to see, understand what this is saying, um, but you can just as mostly to identify that you can get a lot of information. This is a NASA document. It is in the public domain. Um, NASA, as you can imagine, has an abundance of data and likes to share it, so any NASA document has tons of metadata. Who does not know what metadata is here, by the way? I'm sorry, I made an assumption. Okay, metadata is data about data. It is, you, is do you have a question? Or are you just... 
This is metadata. And I, can, I will get into this discussion afterward. Um, right now, I'm going to continue forward, and we can have a religious discussion about the, the semantics of data and metadata later. Um, so we will run through here. It not only reads metadata, it writes it as well. There is a permission system on the archive. You can't update things that aren't your own. Duh. Otherwise, we'd have a lot of vandals run, rampaging through there. Um, so if you own items that you have uploaded, you can use the metadata API to update that. So OK, that's pretty cool. But wait, there's more. Of course there's more. There's always more. It's the archive. And what we have here is the IAS3 API. This is the Internet Archive S3-like API. I maintain the documentation for this right here at GitHub, patches welcome, particularly if they are translations. Um, that would be lovely because right now it's only in English because that's the only one I speak fluently unless you want me to translate it into ancient Greek, in which case, fine. Um, so um, this does just about everything at Internet Archive. It's huge, it's, it's powerful. Um, this entire time I've been talking about getting stuff out of the archive. With this, you can get shit into the archive, and that's where the really great magic happens. Um, because something a lot of people don't know about the archive is that we will save anything that is digital. I've talked about audio, I've talked about video, I've talked about you know docs, uh, docs and books and stuff like that. But let's say you're a researcher and you have a huge data set. You can give that to us. We will save it in perpetuity, for free. Do you have Photoshop files? Fine, we'll take that. We will save it in perpetuity for free. Um, GIS, great. Photos, awesome, bring them on. We will save all of these in perpetuity for free, but anything you give us is public because otherwise we are not living up to our mission of universal access to public knowledge. So before you go giving us those really unfortunate photos you took the other weekend, know that people will be able to see them. So what does this API do? Like I said, everything. You can create, you can upload, you can change metadata, you can download anything that's publicly available. It is called the IAS3 API because it is in a drop-in replacement for Amazon S3. Change one URL in your favorite S3 client, and you are instantly writing to the archive instead of to Amazon. Poof, just works. Here's a super easy example. How many of you have worked with S3 before? Yeah, it's a pain in the ass, I think. Having written this documentation, I'm like, oh my god, really? Um, so let's pretend I have a file from New Horizon on its flyby. I'm going to put it in the archive and share it with the world because it's the right thing to do. Um, so here we, I'm going to name it Pluto Flyby because I'm not original. And I'm going to put it in this item. Here's my identifier, Pluto-new-horizon. What this is going to do is this will upload it to the archive, create the item, item. Items, by the way, if you've used S3, they're analogous to buckets in S3. So it'll create a bucket or an item. It'll whip that file up there, add all the metadata, and then it does something that most people don't know the archive does. It's going to take this .mp4, and it's going to convert it to several other formats. There are multiple reasons for this. Um, one is because if we rely upon just one format, we have limited the number of people who can see this file. Let's say that mp4 would only work on Apple. It doesn't. Of course, we know that it doesn't. But if it did, we're going to convert it anyway to Og Vorbis. We're going to convert it to H.264. We're going to convert it to a number of other things. There's a whole table of things to which we convert that. And we will do that with audio. We will do that with books. If you give us a PDF, we will turn it into EPUB. And we will also do a uh, OCR on it and turn it into text. I mean, when we do this just automatically, you can turn it off if you want, but fine, you're crazy, I can't help you with that. Uh, but uh, we, so we do that automatically. It does take some time, particularly with a large file like this one going by Pluto, but um, it's pretty cool. So aside from just making it more accessible to more people, having it in more formats, um, we also do it because lots of copies keep stuff safe. We don't lose data. We have a, an astonishing track record of not losing data. 
1996. How many of you can say that for your companies? Um, but it could happen. So if my original file, for some reason, at some point got corrupt, I will at least have other versions there. So we take our preservation pretty seriously. This is, again, a great big, huge, ugly bolus of API, considerably nicer because somebody, out of the goodness of her heart, wrote up documentation. Um, it's used by several people. Um, two examples off the top of our, my head here is Recap and Global Public Safety Codes. These two do similar things with different types of, uh, of information. Recap was started by Aaron Swartz and his team. Uh, Global Public Safety Codes by Carl Malamute and his team. Uh, I don't know if you know, but in America at least, the, uh, the US federal court documents cost money to see. You have to pay to see this public information. So what Recap does is it allows people to legally pay money, download them, and then immediately put them into the archive. So they become free for everyone to see. Global Public Safety Codes does almost the exact same thing, but with Global Public Safety Codes. You would think that you know safety codes, which are there to keep people from dying, you wouldn't have to pay for because you would want everyone to see them. So shit don't fall on your head when you bill it. Nope, you got to pay for a lot of these. So uh, Carl and his team have freed those um, and doing almost the exact same thing. Allow people to pay them and automatically upload them to the archive. And then there's my favorite user of this API. You might have guessed. Um, NASA uses this. Uh, if you've ever seen the Apollo 13 movie with Tom Hanks, all the original audio from those radio uh, transmissions are available here. All the photos, all the videos of people on the moon, all the original stuff, it's all at the archive and it's really amazing. If you ever want to skeeve off for an afternoon, just go look at that and you're fine. So you're like, but Vicky, life is short, I don't want to use S3. I'm like, I don't blame you, uh, because I didn't want to learn it either. Uh, that's okay, because the archive has your back. More specifically, Jake Johnson of the archive has your back. He has taken the IAS3 API, and the metadata API, and the search API, and he's put it in something called IA Wrapper. It puts it all in this nice little ball that he hands to you, and you're like, yay, I get to play with this. It has utilities for all of this stuff. So you don't have to learn S3, he's done it for you. Um, if that's not good enough, if you are a Python programmer, I'm a Perl girl, but I, I will do Python because it takes all kinds. Um, you can, it comes with a library. You can just include in all of your scripts and all your software. So if you want to write to the archive, you can do it programmatically. Thank you, Jake. I use this myself. This is what I used to upload these very same slides. Um, that's available on GitHub. It's pretty hacky because, again, I don't program anymore. Um, this IA wrapper is about to hit version 1.0. A lot of people are like, well, that's very cute. That's nice. I'll wait for 1.0.1. Don't worry. This thing is beat upon like you wouldn't believe, and that's because archive team uses it. Terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of information flow into the archive every single day using our IA wrapper. If there were bugs, and there are bugs, well, if there were serious problems, they would have found it, and they have, and they fixed them. So even though it's not quite yet at 1.0, this is still worth your time to check out because it's pretty sweet. So like I said, this is only the top of the iceberg. There is so much more to cover, as I'm sure you can imagine, because pff, 24 plus beta, petabytes, right? Uh, so super useless quick recap of what we have covered today. Way back, open library, do we want it? Search, metadata, IAS3, and IA wrapper. These are the APIs I have covered so far today. Um, they are, as far as I know, the only ones we have, but we are uh, constantly evolving. So who knows what's coming next? What is coming next are those, those uh, links I promised I would give you again. If anyone wants to get ready, here they come. There they are. And again, I do believe that this one is the most important, but if you want the slides, they're there, I think. Um, one more link that I personally believe is very important, but I do admit I've got no small amount of bias. <laughs> Please donate to the archive. Um, you know, cup of coffee, man, just pitch it there. Every time your ass is saved by the Wayback Machine, consider pitching some money to the people who make it possible. Because um, 
this, it really does make a difference to us. Don't assume we're getting massive foundation money for this shit, because we're not. We're really not. It's getting easier. Now people are starting to see things disappear. It's getting easier to get funding for it from foundations. But really, for most of our lifetime, it's been people like you who have been keeping us alive. Here's the obligatory slide I must put in here for Alexis. The archive is hiring. Theoretically, um, it is SF or remote. I don't know how that works for people in Australia. So uh, you should write her, just in general, because she's a lovely person. I think you should all write her and say, thank you. And Vicky said to write you. <laughs> um, you know, send her pictures of cats. She will hate that because she's allergic. Um, so if you are ever in the archive or in San Francisco, the archive every single Friday for its entire history has had free lunch for all comers on Fridays. The entire team at, in San Francisco gets together, they sit down, and they all get to talk about what they've been doing that week, everyone. So you get to hear the new and interesting things that are being worked on at the archive. And don't think, oh, I don't want to be a bother. You're not a bother. Paul's done it several times, haven't you? Um, yeah, so you can, and uh, yes, Jacinta's done it. Um, and, and that fine fellow over there, you know, uh, what's your name, sir? Andrew has done it. Um, there's always several visitors every single week. Not only do you get fed free food, which is always cool, but um, you also get a tour of the archive. And again, there's a pipe organ you can play. Um, so yeah, just feel free to drop by the archive anytime you want. Um, so I am at 45 minutes, so I don't have a lot of official time left for questions, but tea break is right after this. If you want to talk to me, I will hang out down here. Um, so there you go. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Vicky. Um, we've got about five minutes for questions. So oh, I guess we have five minutes for questions. Yay. Oh, wait, he was first. I'm sorry, Paul. What's your name, sir? Don't forget that one. Here. Serge. My name Hi. is Serge. Hi. Uh, the question is, do you publish uh, hashes of the archives? Do we publish, publish hashes. hashes? Yes. Um, in what way? So basically, if I do not have like enough capacity to keep uh, the copy of all the archive myself, but I have capacity to have uh, a copy of the hashes, which might be just a few megabytes, to make oh. sure that they have not been modified. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, so yes, for each individual file for each item. Because okay. an item can contain many files. Um, and that's where the derivations come in. They all get kind of in this one single bucket. Each file gets an MD5 hash. Okay. So you can check all those out. Great. And can it be downloaded? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, everything's open. You have like uh, 85 terabytes available for researchers, right? Uh, 80, I believe. 80. But if you wanted more, I'm sure they're not going to quibble. Yeah, but that is out of uh, 70, 65 petabytes. Or? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how they selected the 80, whether it's just like the first 80 off the top or where they even got that number, to be honest. But write Alexis and ask her, and she will definitely give you as Thanks. much information as you need. Thank you. You're very welcome. Paul, did you have a question, dear? Or is it a comment hiding as a question? OK. Um, so, a uh, very quick question about storing things at the Internet Archive. We had the, the S3-like API. Um, is the only requirement that they be like publicly redistribu redistributable? So, if you have like Creative Commons non-derivative things that you've picked up from other people, I can upload those? Absolutely. Yes, you can. Thank you. If other people have given you permission to share their stuff, we will save it. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, I, so I speak at OSCON every year. It's my favorite conference. Sorry, LCA, it's my first time here. <laughs> um, and O'Reilly and OzCon does this really cool thing where even though they do sell access to the videos, as a speaker, you are allowed to download and do whatever in the hell you want with it. Guess what I do with mine? <laughs> They're all here on Internet Archive, and you can feel free to do that yourself. Um, another question. Yes, dear. What's your name? My name's Andrew. Uh, Hello. Do you ever get to researchers who have giant great scads of data and who want to sort of donate it but it's hard for you just by volume um, so people who have large amounts of data that they want to share uh, yes all the time it's called sneaker net they literally mail us hard drives or if they're in town feel free to just visit the archive and bring your stuff in 
by the way, Internet Archive is on an Internet 2 backbone, and oh my God, the speed's there. Not that I would have gone into the office to BitTorrent anything or anything like that, <laughs> but it's astonishing how fast it is. But, so if you have a lot of data and you happen to be in the Bay Area, going in is easily the fastest way to get shit onto the archive. Uh, someone else? Oh, Matt, you troublemaker. <laughs> And it's a troublemaker question, too. I was curious about um, DMCA takedowns and how that works and how many of those you get. DMCA takedowns, how they work. Um, so we will obey the law. That's kind of a, you know, just gimme. We will obey the law. But we are going to make you prove it. So um, if you can prove that this is your thing that you have copyrighted and that you have the right to tell us to take it down, we will do so because it's the right thing to do. It's the law. If you can't, sorry, good luck, have fun. Um, we do uh, default to as open as possible, as often as possible. And again, I keep saying we, and I haven't been at the archive forever, so I, I am kind of acting as a representation. Um, Hewlett Packard Enterprise has nothing to do with this. Yes, dear. Uh, What's hi, your my, name, ma'am? My name is Jessica. Hello, Jessica. Um, can you give us a bit of an idea of um, what the operating cost is to keep this all running and what the shortfall is between your regular funding sources and what you rely on from, from donations? Um, I can tell you because it's pretty much all I know. Um, I will, everything I know is yours. Uh, we don't hide anything, partly because we're a nonprofit. We can't, right? There are papers filed for this sort of shit. We are a 14 to $15 million a year uh, operation. I know that. I do not know the shortfall. Um, I was able to give you a bit of a breakdown of where we get our money, uh, but other than that, I don't know whether there is a shortfall. If there is, we have been known in the past to get um, donations from the um, Bruce DeKale Foundation. Um, Bruce DeKale is the founder of Internet Archive, the inventor of WAIS, the creator of Alexa Internet. So he has a little bit of cash, which he can if he needs to fund our way, but he we would rather just do it the right way. <laughs> it's very acrobatic sort of yeah, mini great. comp here, isn't it? Cool. Um, that's about all we've got time for. So thank you very much, Vicky. Thank you.